Welcome to our first lecture on what is a logo. So this is Corporate Identity 1. We're going to spend most of the semester creating logos. So we might as well start out with defining what a logo is. OK, so large bucket term is sign. So a sign is a visual language used to communicate something to people. So we'll talk about in the next lecture um, some of the nuances of signs and their subcategories being icons, indexes, and symbols. But just think of sign as the largest term to talk about visually communicating information. I think when you see your sign, you immediately think like a road sign, um, which is definitely a type of sign. It's communicating whether it's a speed limit or there might be deer crossing or there's children at play. The, a road sign is communicating information visually. So we'll talk about what is an icon and an index and a symbol in more detail in the next lecture. Um, but let's just say a sign is something visual. And Within the idea of symbols, which some of you might have taken the um, symbolism class already, are logos. So logos are defined as a unique symbol that identifies a product, business, or individual. So a logo is specific to identifying something. Um, it's usually something to do with commerce. So a product like a logo would be like the you know Ritz crackers the Ritz logo on the crackers a business name whether it's target store um, or whatever business or individual so a lot of times like in fashion you have designers where their actual name is a logo right like Tommy Hilfinger or Vera Wang those kind of people so that is what we're talking about when we say a logo. It's a unique symbol, meaning it's special um, and no other symbol is just like it. And it identifies something, whether that's a something is a product, a business or an individual. OK. So it's this catch all term for this emblematic visual visualization of a brand. So um, and so it's visual, a visual label identifying. So there's usually a name or words so that you can read the logo. And it's also emotive. So it's conveying a specific attitude for this business or this individual or this product. So I think that's really important to realize the two pieces that make up a logo is this idea of a visual label providing identification Usually the identification has to do with words that you can read and also that it is emotive. It's not just words or a word. It is also conveying this broader attitude. OK, so what isn't a logo? So it's important to realize that a logo doesn't sell anything. Um, the logo is not the place to talk about all the great features of a product or a summary of what the product does or what the business does. It is not about selling the consumer or trying to convince the consumer or the viewer of anything. A logo instead should just identify, right? So we said it's a visual label, but it isn't selling anything. Additionally, a logo is very rarely a visual description of a business um, or a verbal description of a, of a business, right? A logo does not have to be a visual representation of what the business does or sells. Instead, this logo should be more emotive. It should be conveying an attitude about the business, not depicting specifically what the business is selling. So I think those are two good distinctions of what a logo isn't. OK, so where are logos? Can you all think of where logos might be? Where have you seen a logo? 
on. Logos are everywhere, right? You've seen them on store signs, you've seen them on store fronts, you've seen them on packaging, you've seen them in the circulars that come in your mail, you've seen them on clothing, you've seen logos everywhere. Um, you've also seen them on your smartphone, right? On all of your app icons are logos. Um, and so logos are everywhere. Um, I think the other thing I want to say about logos is logos, I think, in the 1950s were all about creating this um, whole idea of brand and a visual identifying, separating one consumer product from another. Um, and it was sort of, you know, very um, an abstract relationship, a very, you know, separate relationship between the product and the consumer. Um, but I think nowadays you have brands and logos are much more of a personal relationship. We touch, we like physically touch the logo, right, by turning on these different apps on our phones multiple times a day. I think we are interacting with logos on our computer screen, right? All of our app icons on our computer screen are just tiny little logos. Um, so this idea that we are using these different logos and these different brands and these different products multiple times a day, that our lives are intertwined with these different brands um, and to the success of our lives with how well we use these different brands has really elevated the idea of logo and of branding, I think, to the next level um, as we move forward in design and in commerce. So logos, important. All right, so that kind of brings us into why are logos so important? We can um, trace the design of symbols all the way back to representing different aristocratic families through think of like family crests in old Europe um, and even to the Red Cross of the Crusaders. So that's obviously centuries and centuries ago. Um, people have been using visual symbols to identify their specific groups. Um, in early commercial contexts, the unique mark definitely helped consumers distinguish one maker's wares from another. And that became more and more important as commerce spread out into the far-flung marketplaces, right? Where maybe originally you traded and bought goods from the people within your local village, and as that village expanded into larger cities and countries, and then, you know, halfway across the world through the, you know, different trade routes, it became really important for the sellers of these wares to make sure when people bought their products, they knew they were getting you know, the rice from the people with the red mark versus the rice from the people with the green mark. Because, you know, they're again, they're trying to create this sense of ownership of, you know, my product is superior. Make sure you're buying my product, not my competitor's product. So as long as there has been business and commerce, there's been this idea and this need to have each business distinguish themselves from their competition. Um, this basic idea definitely accelerated through the industrial age. It was definitely influenced by new technologies like lithography and color printing. As there were more people in the spaces competing for consumers, it became more and more important for businesses to make their product and have a visual, a lasting visual impression through logo marks. Um, so this big red triangle for Bass Ale is actually credited with being the first commercial logo. It was trademarked in 1870. So I think that's kind of cool. It's super old, and yet it feels like such a current baseball font, doesn't it? <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, so 1870, the first commercial logo trademarked. Um, around the mid 20th century, the very practical idea of a trademark or a visual mark to distinguish one's products from its competitors morphed into this more abstract idea of corporate identity. Um, so corporate identity 
the class we're in, um, is just a fancy term developed in the 1950s, actually in the United States, um, as a way to define this positioning of a logo and other aspects of a company's visual communications as something that is going to capture the essence of the brand of the company and it's going to add value to the company. So um, a company's corporate identity was all about creating this extra special essence and extra value to company A to distinguish it from its competitors. Um, so two of the biggest designers of that era um, were Saul Bass and Paul Rand. They were like really the two guys that pushed this idea of corporate identity the farthest and created a ton of logos and a ton of logos that were still relevant for decades and decades after they developed them. Um, so I don't know if you've heard about them or seen any of their work yet, but actually the largest block of white on the right hand side of the screen, those are all logos developed by Paul Rand during the 1950s and 60s. For the most part, um, he worked all the way up to like the early 90s. Um, and then the smaller block on the left under Bass Ale are some logos developed by Saul Bass. So you probably recognize quite a few of these logos. They might not be the current iteration of the logo that you immediately understand, like UPS or Ford, but they probably look similar enough that you see the logo. A lot of these logos were still in play through the 90s, even like 2000s, um, and have just recently had a refresh like UPS, IBM, uh, AT&T over on the left, Quaker Oats. I feel like Kleenex might actually be the current logo still. Or no, now it's curvy. Kleenex, United Way. Like, so a lot of these logos are definitely like still, I think, recognizable. Um, so that is what these guys were all about uh, around 1950s in the United States. Um, this whole idea of corporate identity, this idea of creating a visual language and a visual aesthetic special for that company to again help consumers distinguish this company from competitors was a really big trend basically every company in the world got on board and that's why every company ever now has a logo and some sort of you know organized visual aesthetic to all of their uh corporate communications um, think like business card, letterhead, envelope would be your three main pieces of corporate communication that are all part of this larger corporate identity, visual brand language. Okay, so what makes a successful logo? Let's start there. If we have to make logos, we might as well make successful ones. Okay, so the first thing that makes a logo successful is it needs to identify. It needs to visually represent the brand. Um, the most obvious way a logo can successfully visually represent a brand is to have the name of the brand legible, right? We have to be able to read the business name. That's how we're gonna know how to identify it, right? So all of these logos, whether they have extra graphic elements in them or not, or a little graphic, little extra elements or a lot of extra elements, they all have letters in them and those letters form the names of the brands, right? So visually identifying the brand is important. You can make a really cool mark, but if no one knows what that mark is supposed to be symbolizing, it's not gonna be a successful mark as a logo, okay? The next thing your logo has to do to be successful is it has to grab attention and be memorable. You have to be able to separate yourself, your mark from the competition, and you have to make sure you have one message. Um, I think one message is an important note, right? Because we were saying a logo doesn't sell, a logo isn't, a description of the brand, 
a logo is just one simple, memorable message. And usually that message is emotive. So, um, test, do you remember the different logos that were in that white box from the previous slide? See if you can write down or just say out loud as many of those logos as you can think of. Okay, how many did you come up with? There were seven up there. Okay, so, right, grabbing attention and being memorable. Other ways we're gonna grab attention could be through our color choices, it could be through the shapes we create, it could be through our typefaces. Um, you know, your different design skills are gonna come into play, obviously, to help you grab attention and be memorable be unique, have a clear message, separate yourself from the competition. Separating yourself from competition is also a good note um, if you think about like Coke versus Pepsi, right? Coke, red, Pepsi, blue. Coke, cursive, Pepsi, sans serif, right? So there are distinct visual differences that help the consumer identify one brand over the other. If you think about other competing products, especially in like the food space where there are, there is a, you know, a lot of competition for brand loyalty amongst the different companies that produce essentially the same goods like cola or like crackers. You have very distinct color palettes, very distinct design choices that help the consumer recognize the different brands and remember, oh, at home I have the red box so I have Ritz crackers, I don't have Triscuit crackers at home, right? Simple things like that all go into making a logo successful and helping elevate a brand. Okay. So here's just another slide talking about um, separating oneself from the competitions. These are four logos for four different companies that all ship packages. Um, but I think you can see that they have four distinct looks to them, right? Different color palettes, different font choices, different graphic elements. Um, and I think they all um, are expressing a different attribute or a different emotive feel to them. UPS, you have that brown shield. I think the shield kind of brings up the idea of security right so your packages are going to be safe with ups we're going to make sure your package gets to where it wants to go in one piece on time you can trust us we're protective right shield i think the fedex logo is very friendly it has like a very happy palette to it the it's very easy to read the letters are all close together there's that secret arrow if you've never noticed the negative space between the e and the x is a little arrow pointing to the right. If you've never seen that before, now you'll never unsee it again. Um, so I think the FedEx logo is all about friendly. We are customer focused. We are accessible. Um, don't feel intimidated by the confusion of shipping packages. We are gonna help you. We are gonna make sure your package gets to where you want it to go without feeling overwhelmed and confused. The United States Postal Service has the eagle, right? That eagle, that italic typeface in all caps, this is the authoritative logo. We are the United States Postal Service. We are the original mail carrier. We are the authority. We are the, you know, the national federal company that is gonna make sure your stuff gets to where it needs to go. We have the nationalism behind us. We have, you know, all of that patriotic, governmental, authoritative symbolism in our eagle, in our stylistic rendering of this eagle and of this typeface. It all feels, you know, forceful um, and strong. And I think it's trying to show some sort of movement as well, right, with the italics. So again, very different feel. And then the last logo is DHL. 
it's on slant, it's got some horizontal lines. This logo is all about movement. You need something to be shipped fast. We are your people. We are on the move. We are going. We are a high energy. We are expeditious, right? Bright colors, high contrast, color palette, bold, horizontal lines. This logo is moving, has the most movement for sure of the four, right? So you can kind of see yeah, all these companies are working in shipping, and yeah, they're all visually distinct, but they're all vi they're also very emotionally distinct, right? They have different main attributes they're trying to convey to the consumer. So when you're looking at these four logos, we all, as designers, and now that we know what we're looking at, might have read a little more into these logos than the normal consumer, but a regular consumer maybe is not gonna be able to articulate how they're feeling about each of these logos and the way that I just articulated that to you, but they are gonna definitely come away with a distinct opinion about the four companies that they saw the logos for. So you compound that onto specific personal experience you have as a consumer, right? UPS got my package to where I wanted it to go on time, great. The Postal Service lost my box in the mail and it was a pain in the ass to track it down and I was so annoyed I'm never shopping with them again, right? Those personal experiences on top of the overall brand of a company or the different logo marks of a company all compound to create this sense of brand. Okay, and our last uh, thing that makes a logo successful would be being emotive and making an impression. And I think I've sort of been saying this the whole time, but now we have it written out specifically. Your logo needs to be practical, it needs to be simple in form, and it needs to be distinctive, and it needs to be graphic. Um, so I think all of those terms are all about, basically, you need to have, again, you're making one message, one voice, one emotion or one characteristic, one attribute that you really want to convey to your consumer. Consumer is not going to remember a whole paragraph about your company, but they are going to remember a couple key words, maybe a color, a type style, how that logo made them feel. Um, and that's really what this note is about, making sure your viewer feels something when they look at your logo. Um, so this group of logos I have, they're all set in black but they're all for different sport apparel companies. Um, and you can see they all have maybe a lot of similar characteristics, right? There's a lot of like um, angles and hard lines and different ways to try to show movement and action and sport. But at the same time, they also have a lot of unique aspects to them that make them all stand out and be visually different. Um, but I think you can say they're definitely all graphic, they're definitely all distinctive, they're definitely simple in form, meaning that they're not overly complex. There's not like a ton of tiny little details that I have to really go through and understand. I can quickly look at any of these logos and recall the basic shape, hopefully the name, um, and maybe a basic attitude that was coming through. Um, that's part of the be practical note as well. You can't have a logo that's so intricate, whether it's so intricate in design, in line work, in color, in gradients, in textures, anything that's like overly complex. It takes the viewer's brain longer to read all that visual information and makes it harder for the viewer to recall the, what the key message was because it's just so many details. And it's also impractical think about logos have to be able to be scaled really, really big on sides of buildings and really, really small on clothing labels and business cards and apps on your phone. So you have to have a logo that has flexibility, that has practicality in using it, right? Because a logo that can't be used is not a logo. Okay. So now that we've seen a bunch of logos and talked about what makes a logo successful, being they um, identify, they grab attention and are memorable, and they are emotive and make an impression. There are five basic categories for what type of logo you could design. So we're gonna go through those. Okay, 
Um, and it's also really important to know the differences um, of logos so that when you're talking to a client, you can really help nail down what your client is looking for and what you're asking, what your client is asking you to do when they say design a logo. That's a very broad ask. So our first type of logo we could be designing is a logo type or a word mark. You can use either word. This type of logo contains only stylized letters representing the literal name of a company. Basically, if you see something in a company's logo that can't be read, it isn't a logo type. Okay, so these are all examples of logo types. You can read every single thing in the logo. Um, logo types, I think, are one of the more popular logos. I think it's not what we as designers maybe initially think of when we think of logos. We usually, I think, probably think of graphics and intricate designs, um, but just a simple logo type or word mark is one of the more popular logo solutions, I think for the obvious reason that it identifies the company, right? Um, you sometimes have an issue with logo types when you're talking about um, companies that are working in a, the global economy, right? Because if you have a logo type that depends on being read, if it's said in American English, it could be confusing for people who aren't familiar with the Latin alphabet. Um, and even sometimes some like company like Coca-Cola, they modify their logo type for the different markets that they're in, um, which I think is kind of an interesting side note um, if you're ever working on such a huge global brand. Um, but for the most part, as you start to move about uh, life here, you're going to start to realize that a lot of logos are, in fact, logo types. So there's nothing wrong with being simple. Um, just the correct typeface set in the correct color can definitely still express, you know, express a lot and be emotive and interesting, which I think all of these logo examples show you. Okay, so sort of like a cousin to the logo type is the symbol mark um, or the letter mark. Um, oh, sorry, not the symbol mark, the letter mark. The letter mark is used just creating the initials of a brand name. So I think some of these letter marks are more stylized than others, and that is perfectly okay, but they are all derived from the initial or initials of the brand or of the company name. Okay, so then the third type is a symbol or a symbol mark. Um, so a symbol, I think, is what we all naturally think of when somebody says a logo. Um, so a symbol is the pictorial, the abstract, or non-representational approach, creating some universal symbol to represent a product or business or individual. Um, so these are all examples of symbols. So one thing to note about symbol logos um, is that the product or business name is often part of the logo and typeset near the mark to create the full logo, but the, um, the typeset part of the logo and the symbol do not interact. They're two separate elements so that each piece can be seen alone as well as together. Um, and then since a logo needs to be able to visually identify the company, it's a logo for, um, you know, as brands start out and they're not very known, the symbol mark is only successful with the typeset name of the company with it. Um, but then as a brand becomes more well known, becomes more established, then you can often start to see just the symbol without the identifying letters with it. So I think all of these are examples of symbol marks that have become so elevated that we don't need the descriptor. We know what these companies are. Right? See if you can test your knowledge. Do you know what all these companies are?
going to be honest, I couldn't figure out a couple of them. <laughs> but so you can see these are the different logos, uh, these different symbol logos with the typeface or the typeset of the company name with the mark. So you can see how they're working. Other than Starbucks, which I think is an anomaly, um, the other five logos, you could very easily take the text off, the symbol stays, it doesn't change, the mark is still consistent. So that is what makes it a symbol mark. Uh, so like a random fifth or fourth type of mark uh, is a character icon. So the Michelin Man, the Chiquita Banana Lady, the Affleck Duck, these different characters or cartoons or illustrations that are developed to embody the personality of the brand. Um, I think these are not really in vogue anymore um, or sometimes are used in addition to uh, a more corporate mark, um, but that is a type of logo that you could design a character icon. Okay, and then our last type of mark is called a combination mark or an emblem. Um, so this is where there are words and images that are always seen together. These marks, the images and the words cannot be separated. Um, so I think, as you can see, all of these brands, it would wouldn't really make sense to try to take the picture away from the words or the words away from the pictures. These logos are designed to work as one thing. So that is the difference between these and the symbol marks, which are designed in such a way where the symbol, the visual, and the words are separate pieces that can easily be removed and the other thing is not affected visually. These combination marks cannot be separated. The visual and the words are working together to create the larger logo and the larger message. Okay, so now I want to talk about responsive logos. So responsive logos are these, this is like a new concept in logo design, um, sort of came about probably 10, five, 10 years ago now. Um, they're all, the def definition of a responsive logo is logos that are shape shifting, that can change in size or complexity or even in color to accommodate and adapt to wherever they are placed. So this idea came about um, as we ended up with more and more devices, more and more places logos are seen, um, and those more and more places started to become smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so back um, in the 1950s when corporate identity was a thing and logos became um, a really important thing to business, um, Paul Rand and Saul Bass and these guys, they were all about, you never touch the logo, the logo is holy, the logo must always be the same every single time a consumer sees it because you don't want to confuse a consumer. It needs to be consistent. You never, ever, 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 ever change the logo. That idea, I think, is still held by a lot of uh, old school designers. However, I think in today's world where we have websites that have that are responsive, right? A website looks a little different on your computer versus your tablet versus your phone. Um, you have now smartwatches, you have widget icons, you have all these tiny, tiny things um, where it just became impractical to put logos in these different spaces set so tiny, right? They became illegible, which then ruins the whole point of the logo. So um, we have responsive logos. Um, these are kind of considered like contextual logos. So you'll have some logos that are specific for print and some that are specific for digital. Um, I think it's really typical to see um, every company pretty much has a color logo and then a black version and a white version of the same logo. Seeing as, you know, if you wanted to like run a ad in a newspaper, you need to have just a black and white logo, right? So that was probably one of the very first 
responsive logo, like a versioning of a logo. Um, so I have another slide, but I think this kind of shows you what I'm talking about, where like the Premier League logo, it's really big on the computer. And then you can see as it gets onto smaller and smaller devices, it changes, whether it's changing orientation from horizontal to vertical, then Premier League changes to just the initials, PL, and we lose it all together and we just have the symbol on the phone and the watch. So that is how responsive logos work. So here are a whole bunch more. Um, so let's see. So this whole adage of never change the logo um, to build brand awareness is just really not practical anymore. Um, and it's not to say that responsive logos should all be different from one another, but it's more about creating different versions of the same thing and then optimizing them to fit in their different contexts. So um, you have, you start out with your full main logo and then it's distilling down the essence of that logo to accommodate smaller and smaller real estate. Um, so there was a designer who I didn't write down his name. Oh man, all right, well anyway, there was this designer who did this whole basically like campaign um, on responsive logos and to try to like show the business community and other designers, this idea of never change the logo is just not necessary anymore. I think consumers are so savvy now, we're so inundated with logos, we understand the idea of brand. Your average person understands and has heard of the word brand. They understand what a logo is. Um, so, you know, we have savvy consumers now. You can take your logo and distill it down into its essence and people will still recognize what it is. That idea would have blown people's minds in the 1950s. People did not give the consumer that much credit. Um, so I think nowadays people are giving the consumer a little more credit that they can recognize the same brand, even if the logo changes slightly. So anyway, there's this one designer who took a bunch of very well-known brands and started creating these responsive logos to prove his point. Um, and I really, mad I don't remember his name. But anyway, these are a bunch of logos that he created. Um, so, uh, and as you can see, the top logo is like the full logo. And then as it goes down, it gets mo both smaller and you're starting to distill down to the essence of the brand. Um, so that is both taking stuff away, obviously like taking away visual elements, but it's also simplifying the elements that you have. Um, and I think a good example of that is in like the Warner Brothers one, the very tiniest logo reversed out the WB and the shield because it's easier to read it that small reversed out than as a shielded outline with no fill. Same thing with Kodak on the one next to it. So like those little horizontal lines at a certain size, it doesn't make sense to have the horizontal lines anymore. You can't read them because the logo is so tiny. So it's now just a filled shape. And then I like this tomato catch, Heinz tomato ketchup one because I think it's funny that the most recognizable part about Heinz tomato ketchup is actually not the logo. It is the shape of the label. Um, and so I think that's really clever how the tiniest version of this logo is just the label shape. But if you saw just that tiny logo, wouldn't you recognize it as Heinz tomato ketchup? Especially set on red, right? And so I thought that was that one's kind of clever. Okay, so here is our quick logos recap. You made it to the end of this lecture. So logos should identify by visually representing the brand. They should grab attention and be memorable. They should be separating themselves from the competition. They should have one message. Logos should be emotive and they should make an impression. And to do that, they need to be practical, simple in form, distinctive and graphic. Then we talked about there are five different types of logos. So when someone says, make me a logo, your question should be, what type of logo are you thinking of? 
and your five options are below. So I'll give you a chance to name them and then I will tell you if you are correct. The first one is, yes, a word mark or a logo type. The second one is, initial, right. The third one is, Symbol mark. Fourth one is character icon. And the last one is a combination mark or an emblem. Okay, great job. We now all know what we're talking about when we talk about the word logos. There is an exercise one up on Drive for you to complete, which is just a quick little one page worksheet on recapping what you learned in this lecture just to help reinforce the main points. Thanks so much. See you in class.